a very warm welcome to everyone uh, to yet another uh, mm. webinar from the nature writing for children series brought to you by azim print university my name is shashwati c and i'm part of the uh, research communication team at the university you know ever since we started this series back in october of uh, 2020 i remember uh, the mentor of the series professor harini nagendra she had, she had spoken about the necessity to have these conversations on nature writing as a genre you know she had i remember she had said something that it brings us close you know writing nature writing of this sorts brings us closer to nature and it, and it increases the connect with nature be it fiction or non fiction books and fortunately over the past many years we have seen a you know, a resurgence of sorts in terms of the writings that have come on books of uh, you know based on themes of nature for children toddlers and young kids as well and adults of course so our, our our idea behind the series has been to you know kind of engage our readers authors and you know people who want to write books on um, themes based on nature and have this conversation with people who have really done you know great amount of work in this domain so through these conversations every month we we keep bringing new aspects of newer and newer aspects uh, of uh, you know uh, this genre itself so you know keeping up with that tradition of a monthly conversation we have with us a very uh, i should say very illustrious illustrious writer today uh, zai who, who joins us today from chennai she is the managing trustee of the madras crocodile bank which she co-founded in 1976 uh, she has written a, a plethora of books you know 20 plus books for children largely based on the themes of nature and you know environment like kali and the rat snake and the man's boy cobra in my kitchen and of course the book that we'll be talking about today is salim mamu and me uh she also comes from a very you know illustrious family of conservationists which is also going to be part of the conversation that we are going to touch upon today and she has been an academician for over 18 years teaching children and she was also a principal of a montessori school so with that you know with that introduction thank you so much zai for joining us uh today for this conversation and it's a pleasure to have you today Well, thank you for inviting me. Yes, sir. So, so be before I start this thing uh, with Zai, I just have one small uh, note to mention to all our viewers here. If you have any questions or queries or comments mm -hmm. that you would like to post to Zai, you can uh, just type them into the live chat box. Sometime during towards the end of this conversation, we'll just pick them up, and you know, we possibly have this uh, post them to Zai itself. So without uh, you know, uh, so let's start this conversation, Zai. Uh, so to to begin, when if you can uh, you know take us through your journey as a writer. I remember reading somewhere that you you had uh, you had spoken about how as a ten year old you had written something you know, uh, Gumang the spindle and that that's something that you had written <laughs> long back. And from there, coming from there, which you were not very happy about, of course, but coming from there to the books that uh, Sunny Mamu and me, and the books that are going to come subsequently. So, if you could just take it through. So yes, that was a horrible little story about a bunny rabbit. But um, I often think about that journey because it's always so interesting to look back at one's childhood. and peg the points that were of importance and the first thing uh was that i mean obviously we all to some extent grow up to be uh what we see around us as children and uh both my parents were not only very keen on nature and conservation um but they were both writers so one grew up i think my sister and i especially grew up thinking that this is what one has to do in life you know sit down at a desk and write so um that was very much a part of our growing up and my parents were very encouraging to us even though even when we wrote awful stuff which we often did uh and we also had family and friends who straddled both these worlds of writing and conservation um one of these was of course my uncle salim the, the ornithologist he was uh, he often visited us we were often at 
where he lived because that was my grandparents' house. So um, we would often spend weekends or longer at that place. And my sister and I had our bedroom, which was the guest room, just above where his office was. And uh, he didn't like noise. So that was a problem for us because we liked to be noisy and play and all us six or seven cousins would get together and be very boisterous and he'd have to come up and tell us to be quiet. But I think that was my first um, uh, kind of observation of how disciplined somebody can be. And, um, you know, five o'clock his typewriter would start clacking away. Uh, he had a very disciplined routine throughout the day. Um, and um, growing up watching that and other such people around us was, I think, a very important part of what we became, or rather what I hoped we became to some extent. Uh, to go back to your question about the book, Salim, Mamu and Me, um, I think, uh, again, I mean, the book is my story, is that I... Um, I was hopeless at identifying birds. I still am, though I enjoy bird watching a lot. And um, it just kind of, it, it, it's been sitting in my mind since I was a child, basically, this feeling of being surrounded by experts and not knowing anything yourself. Uh, and the pressure that you feel on yourself, even though nobody is doing it to you. And I think the next part of this journey was probably when I was a teacher in Cody School, and we once did a story about a child who has this inferiority complex. And we all discussed this in terms of our own experiences, our own childhoods. And the students came up with um, their stories, their experiences. One, I remember, said that he'd always felt that his sibling was much more popular and much more loved than he was uh, because he was better looking, a better sportsman, and so on and so forth. So it became a very meaningful discussion for all of us, and I shared my story about birds and Salemamu with them, and I think a lot of them connected to it. So that kind of highlighted it. And then years later, when I was talking to um, editors of Tulika, and I must have again mentioned this, and one of them, I think it was Radhika Menon, said, you know, I think that would make a really good story. And I thought about that, and I felt, yes, and a very important one for children to read and uh, pro probably a lot of them would be able to relate to that. So uh, just a little aside that this is also such an important part of what publishers do for us writers. It's not just publishing our books and selling them, but also kind of nudging us in the right direction. And this has happened to me several times especially with Tulika, and for which I'm very grateful. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that, you know, what uh, very interesting about the book was, of course, its title itself. Uh, uh, Salim Mamu, uh, Mamu is, is a term which has a lot of you know uh, personal touch to it. So how did you decide upon that uh, title? And also the illustrations are fabulous uh, in that book itself, including uh, you know your own as a six-year-old child. So just take yeah, the, the illustrations are wonderful. Illustrations well, Salim Mamu and me. I mean, once you read the story, you know that. It's a very natural title. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it because of your question, I wonder what else I could have named it. So it was 
just very natural. It's the story of Salemamu and me. So that's what the title um, is. Um, and um, the illustrations, I think, really make the book. Uh, she took a lot of trouble to research my family. And I was delighted to see how much the, my father looks like himself in the illustrations. Uh, Salemamu is always an um, easy person to illustrate. I mean, not for me, but for professional uh, artists and illustrators, because he's so distinctive with his long hooked nose and uh, whatever. So. Um, yeah, again, illustrations, very, very important um, for the writer and illustrator to work together. And I've been very lucky with illustrators as I have with publishers because they really get what I'm trying to say. Uh, especially in this book, the ex my expressions, the expressions of Zai as various <laughs> things are going on. I was really very happy about those. Yeah. So interestingly, you have also uh, this book is as much about uh, the aspect of birding as as well. So, uh, if you can tell us about your experience of birding, how the, how how much of a birder? Because we know about you through the book that you know the kind of uh, struggles that you had initially. But subsequently, how, how how have you evolved as a bird? And which are your favorite birds for that matter? Well, I continue to have the same struggles, but um, it, it doesn't matter so much to me anymore. And I think, as I always like to say, I've learned to enjoy birds without necessarily knowing their names. Um, I go out, I've just come back from a wonderful camping holiday in New Mexico. And um, I was telling somebody who was with me that um, I like the birds there because they're big, bold, colorful, and easy to recognize. And it's the small little brown jobs that one hates because, um, you know, it's very difficult, at least for me, to identify them. And the other problem I had and continue to have is that everyone expects that because I'm Salimamu's niece, I will be this great expert who can tell them everything about birds. Unfortunately, that's not true. But I do, I do love looking at birds. I do enjoy it very much. Wonderful. Also, also one of the things about the book has been, and it kind of makes you nostalgic. This book is very rooted in in the city of Mumbai, for that matter. You, know, you talk in the book about the Andheri group, the Bandra group, and the Dada group. So, so that aspect. Tell us about your experiences, uh, reminiscences of, and you have subsequently stayed at multiple cities. Right now, you are in Chennai. You stayed in Bangalore as well for a long time. So, you, how much of that city was there, and what do you recall well about the city itself? Well, it all I can uh, recall is that it was a very it was a different place altogether um, from what it is now, and I love Mumbai, but I love it the way it was, so and not the way it is now. So it's a rather hopeless kind of love. Um, today I live in Chennai, and I'm very lucky to be able to live where I do because it's not in the city, it's outside the city uh, at the Crocodile Farm, which is a big open campus. And I have the beach in front of me and the crocodiles behind me. So uh, I'm very happy. But Bombay in those days was, um, I mean, there were still leopards when I was, maybe the year I was born, actually, 1954, a leopard was seen in Bandra. And um, there, there was forest in, there were really healthy patches of forest inside and just on the periphery of the city. The film city and all the other developments around Burivli hadn't come up. So 
that was where we went over weekends, one of the places we went to. And it was just like you drive for half an hour and you're in what today we would call a national park. So it was quite a luxury growing up in Bombay in those uh, times. But now as cities go today, I would say Chennai is my favorite. I love living here. I love the people and um, especially being here at the Croc Bank. That's very special for me. That's wonderful. Because I was going to, the next question was going to be about your work at the Croc Bank itself, how you have established uh, in back in 76 and your work that has been, you know, just t tell us about your, because that's a very fascinating story, your, you know, this uh, work in conservation that you're actually doing on a long place. Yeah, so I was very lucky to be a part of that whole initiative. Um, in fact, when my uh, ex-husband Rom and I got married in 74, uh, that was the first thing. I think we talked about nothing but the crock bank all the time because um, for that couple of years we'd known each other before. This was what we really wanted to do together. Um, by then, um, he had been on several surveys with uh, other people and with me all over the country. And it was becoming obvious that um, the three species of crocodiles, the gharial, the saltwater croc and the mugger, uh, had got very seriously depleted because of hunting for the skins and the destruction and taking over of the habitat for human development. So the idea originally was to uh, build up a good, healthy gene pool of these three species, breed them in captivity, and release the young into the wild. And in those days, in the 70s, one still talked about the wild, like, you know, there were still habitats where you could release these animals. And this was something that the forest department was working with us on. We were identifying places where they could be released. Um, but then over the next 15, 20 years, what happened is that um, we had these crocodiles ready to go. And um, the forest department found out that through their surveys that people were not, that the habitats had become too inhabited by people. So we were left with these, you know, in terms of species, almost 2000 mugger, for instance, with nowhere to go and very expensive in terms of feeding and husbandry. And it's only now in the last, within the last couple of years, that that problem has been solved thanks to a rescue and rehab center in Gujarat, which have taken over uh, over 800 of our magar. So we now have a bit more space and a bit more finances to do other things. But uh, apart from the sur surplus croc problem, we, um, so this is a research, um, and uh, education and conservation center. Apart from the croc bank, we have field stations where species of endangered reptiles are being studied. Uh, we have a king cobra field study station in the Western Ghats, uh, one for the Gharial on the Chambal River. And we started one in the Andaman Islands for the endemic reptiles in the Andamans. Uh, which is now being taken over and run very capably by Dakshin Foundation in Bangalore. So um, we have uh, visitors coming. We do programs for school children and teachers on reptiles and their natural history and conservation. Uh, we have night safaris where people can come in and uh, look at the glowing eyes of crocodiles, which is always a very exciting thing. 
Uh, we have a very uh, active volunteer program. Young people can come and work for a month here and get involved with all the husbandry and maintenance work that is going on. So they go away with a very good idea of what reptiles are and how they can be cared for. So I would say that that is uh, one of the big successes of the Croc Bank is that we've created this new leadership of reptile conservationists because so many of them who've come here as volunteers have gone away to lead institutions and organizations or very significant field projects. So we're very, I personally am very proud of that, of that contribution of the croc banks. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. In fact, one of the talks we had a couple of months back was with Jerry on snakes, who has also, you know, kind mm -hmm. of uh, learned much of his thing. And he was also uh, uh, here itself. for quite some time. Yeah. Yes. So I, you know, coming to that, how much of that learning or things that, uh, say, the characters at the Croc Bank, how much of them find their way into your stories and your work itself? Um, I think a lot, a lot of it does. Um, I started um, my writing in natural history, in reptiles per se, of course, after I married Ron and we were working at the snake park together. So my, part of my job was to write uh, material about reptiles, about snakes, about snake bite, um, how not to get bitten, what to do if bitten, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then somewhere along the way, I kind of dipped my feet into fiction, but bringing in reptiles into it. And probably Kali and the Rat Snake was the first book in that um, line. Uh, so after that, I would say that all the fiction that I've written has been about conservation in some form or the other. There's one uh, imposter in my list of books. I suddenly wrote this story about a cricket match between two villages, and I really enjoyed that as well. But apart from that, it's a lot of personal experience. For example, Andaman's boy, I was lucky to go to the Andaman Islands several times. So it's all about that. Um, Kali and the rat snake, <coughs> the humongous story. We used to keep mongooses as pets, so got to know them very well. And of course, the, the book that I've just finished and which is about to come out the, uh, called Termite Fry is about the Irula community, which we got to know very well. We were very lucky in that sense. Very interesting. And also one thing, uh, speaking about your the family, illustrious family that you have, is, uh, we'll start with the uh, the protagonist of the uh, the book that we have today, uh, uh, The Birdman of India, Salim Ali. You have, you, you've written it very uh, loving and endearingly about your encounters with him. And it's not only this book, you have you've written a full-fledged book on him. There are numerous articles in him. If you can just... You know, give us a kind of a sense of the person that he was. You know, we, we keep getting these uh, things. I remember, mm -hmm. like you were talking about his study being there in your home, and uh, you used to play hide and seek, and you know, uh, you used to hide underneath the, the bed, and he wouldn't look there. So you know, those this kind. There's a very at one stage we know him as a very you know a dark kind of a person who's very engrossed with his work, and and through your writings we discover another aspect of him altogether. Well, that's an interesting um, question. I think for one, he really loved children. Uh, now that I look back so often and at old family photographs, um, a real sparkle in his eyes when he's 
uh, talking and interacting with children. And very often, these children who are now, you know, my age, um, started out bird watching because of him. He would take them along and he had a lot of patience with children, which he didn't always have with adults. And I think that was really important. Um, the other thing that I remember very clearly is his, um, his sense of humor. And whenever I say this, people say, well, give us some examples, which is very difficult to do because so much of it was contextual. Uh, so much had to do with his gestures and funny faces. Uh, so it's hard to relate his humor, but uh, whenever he was around, there was a lot of laughter. So um, this, is, this is a very important part of him. And um, he was a, an excellent mentor. I think about him and my father, who was also a bird person, and Rom as three people who are excellent guides as naturalists. And they are always so keen on the other person, uh, you know, their student or whoever being successful and not holding anything back. And I, and I see the value of that because I've been a teacher for about 20 years. And that is such an important part of teaching. So Salim Amu definitely had that. I think, you know, a lot of people from the Bombay Natural History Society have spoken about this and uh, we saw it. So it's something to really appreciate, I think, about him. And how, how would you kind of, you know, relate to the, the, the India of the 80s and the 90s where there was a lot of this consciousness about uh, nature itself. We, we had launched the Project Tiger and um, Sa Salim Ali was also involved in a lot of these conservation yeah. movement itself. The Silent Valley was there. Yeah. And, yeah. and yet in these times that we live together where it, it's all the more important, we are we're kind of missing on those, you know, champions who can, you know, who can drive us and, you know, kind of inspire us. Right. Kind of well, actually, we were very much uh, in the thick of it. Um, my, when my father started the WWF India in, it must have been 71, maybe 70, 71. At that point, he was uh, on the board of WWF International in Switzerland. And when they decided to start an India office, an India chapter, they asked him to do it. So he got the BNHS to agree to give him a little room on the third floor. And of course, there was no money to hire secretaries and um, people to help him. So my sister and I were roped into that. Um, we would go to WWF after college, help Baba, in those days, we had those cyclostyling machines. There was no Xeroxing and all this stuff. So most of the time, we would come home just covered in ink because you had to ink that roller and then stand there and turn it round and round. And it was quite a messy business. So um, we would, my role was um, to get the newsletter out. And we had a, a page for forest. And I remember Rom wrote an article about Silent Valley. That was one of the first conservation pieces about Silent Valley and a real plea for it to be protected. So uh, there was no escaping it. We were, as I said, in the thick of it. Our guests at home uh, were very often conservationists from other countries or 
other cities who were working with my father. I remember Peter Scott stayed with us, George Shaler, who was a friend of the family's. Uh, so it was fascinating. It was very interesting for us. Sometimes we grumbled that, you know, we couldn't go out with our friends very much because even at age 16, 17, we were so busy at home. Unfortunately, we were both very good typists, my sister and I. So both my parents used us to type their articles. Um, yeah, and Project Tiger was, you know, everyone from the family went to Delhi for the launching of Project Tiger. And my father was very much in the center of it. Yeah. And, and, and still oddly, I was just, you know, uh, while most of the things have changed, there are so, some things that remain uh, quite similar also. I remember uh, reading about your father, the kind of struggles he had uh, for that radio coloring uh, project that he he kind of faced, that kind of, you know, the things, yeah. the bureaucratic setup was there. And that is still, I think, so commonplace even to this day. A lot of projects are, you know, kind of stalled for all those reasons. So right. you know, also I can't hear you. My my apologies. Can you hear me now, Zai? Yeah, now I can. Zai, can you hear me? Yes. I'm really sorry that I got disconnected from the net. Yeah. So I was talking about you. Have, you have spoken about your father. We also want to know your your mother also played a very you know remarkable role in the conservation space. She was also a, you know she she has written a lot of books and all. So if you can just briefly touch upon her, it will be wonderful. Yeah, my mother was a landscape designer and uh, she loved gardens and gardening. Uh, she designed and planted uh, some pretty big gardens, including the Pawai uh, IIT one, I think, and uh, company gardens in Chennai and Bangalore. And she was also a writer and a conservationist. And in fact, she and Salimamu wrote a book together. And I think that was his first book, even before the field guide. It's called Common Indian Birds. And it was published by the National Book Trust. Um, so she and Salimamu were very close. Uh, she also wrote several articles about him. And um, yeah, uh, nudged and bullied my father very often when he was writing something. He would be made to read it out to her and she would criticize and change and suggest. And, you know, so that went on at home all the time. She was a very good editor. Um, my mother grew up in Japan. She was born in Japan and only came to India when she was about 20 years old. Uh, so she grew up with the concept of the Japanese garden, you know, the very minimalistic, open uh, type of spaces. And th the gardens that she created still have that very Japanese stamp on them.
Hi, Zai, I'm really sorry. There's some uh, issue with my form today. So yes, just, just, yeah. I, uh, yeah. So I was, you know, you were talking about uh, after your thing. The one question that we had in mind was the genre of you know uh, nature. I think was there. just some. If you can hear me now, yes. Sorry. So I was just saying the genre of nature writing per se. How? Why do you think it's important, and how important it is for children to you know kind of be, uh, you know, these topics of uh, you know environment, nature, and more importantly, when we are going through a crisis of sorts, thanks to climate change and everything that you know, introducing these topics, how important it is that we you know bring them up with children through these books. Well, of course, it's terribly important. It's uh, the question as it is, is a no brainer. But to take it a little forward, I think that we writers have to remember that the, the pivotal thing about a children's story or a children's book is the story and um, A, the story and B, the quality of the writing. So just to churn out uh, nature stories and nonfiction is not good enough. I think that we all need to um, simply get better at it because, you know, when you look at the books coming out abroad and compare them to what we have here, generally speaking, I think we can do a lot better, both in terms of quantity and quality. And I include myself in it. Yes. And what is, if I were to ask you, what is the process that you follow for, you know, writing these books itself, you know, including Salim Mamu and me and the other books that you do? Uh, I remember you mentioning somewhere that most of these books are born out of the fact that, you know, someone, uh, some publisher has asked you to, you know, write a story or something like that. But once, how much time it takes, what is the kind of process that, and what, as a writer, you know, a lot of people have spoken about that, you know, they, they spend, they have a disciplined, uh, you know, uh, kind of a routine when it comes to writing. Is that the same with you as well? Yeah, it's, uh, it's the same. And uh, with, that's correct. I think the key word is not inspiration, as a lot of people would like to believe, but discipline. And um, I divide my day between my own writing and reading um, and the work that I do for the Croc Bank. So I think just setting down, setting aside that time, sitting at your desk and writing is very, very important. Even if the result is pretty crappy and you have to kind of, you know, work on it a lot. But doing that is really important and do you do you also how do you cope up i'm just asking writers blog this is a question that most of the you know people who, who are aspiring to be writers they have they've kind of shared with us is do you uh, you know uh, do you suffer from writers blog at times and how do you cope up with that you know one answer to that question and again it's an interesting question because I had very serious writer's block with this book that's just coming out called Termite Fry. And it was a very difficult book for me to write. I started it about 10 years ago, in fact. And it went through multiple drafts, um, multiple forms. And part of the problem was that I was too close to the subject and maybe too passionate and emotional about the subject, which is, of course, the Irula community and their lives and history and culture. And um, at two points along that journey, I went, I changed my location. I, once I went to Kodi Canal and stayed with, at a friend's house, she wasn't there. Um, and just that change of scene was, I think, very useful. It sort of nudged me forward. 
And another time I was at a field station in Agumbe and that was also very helpful. So sometimes just a change of scene can actually be very important. But of course, writer's block is also an excuse to not be doing much. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so just, just talking about that as well, you know, the, how, how do you rate your books are very rich. When I it can't, comes to I couldn't hear that. Can you repeat the question? Hello. Yes, I will. I've just. Can you hear me now? Am I audible? Yes. Yes. So I was just saying one of the things that is there. But and you, like we, it's not coming. The audio is not coming. Just a minute. I just. just Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I was saying one of the things that is very important for uh, children books is basically the illustrated part. So how do you how do you kind of you know uh, work with illustrators? Because a lot of people have uh, authors have stated that they like to leave the book uh, in in the in, you know they work independently with the they don't prefer to work with illustrators and try to guide them and so that their creativity is not hampered. What is your view on that subject? Well, I a journey about that starting with, uh, as you say, just leaving it to the publishers and illustrators. And then of course, being part of the group that is looking at the illustrations. There's an echo. Oh, it's good now. Uh, but I've come to the point where uh, I'm very excited. Uh, I'm doing a little children's book uh, about a person who lives in our field station in Agumbe and runs the rescue project for king cobras. So in a couple of weeks, I'm visiting with the illustrator of this book, uh, who I'm very uh, excited to say is Rajiv IP, who's just brilliant, so that we can be there together and get a sense of what we want to come through in the story. The publisher will also be there. And I think this is going to be a very exciting moment for me. Zai, which is very odd. Uh, Rajiv was a was a guest last month, and when I took oh. your name, he was kind of surprised. <laughs> so I guess that surprise was because of this story. Yeah, yeah. And if I were to talk about your relations, you have, you have worked with multiple uh, publishers. So as an author and and a publisher, you know, what is the kind of relationship that you share, the editors that also are there in between? If you can throw some light on that as well. Well, I think uh, in terms of editing, it's really important for the author and the editor to be open. And uh, I've been very lucky in working with some of our best editors in the country, I would say. So, you know, people who have really got to the bottom of what I'm trying to do with the language, um, what, what tone I'm trying to achieve, and supporting me in that, and helping to make the text better. So I, I think the key thing is that the, the, the editor has to also be a writer. And uh, the ones I've worked with have been so it's, it's really been a very exciting process for me. You don't want somebody who's just going to nitpick about little uh, forms of a sentence or the active passive type of uh, issue that comes up. 
but really somebody who understands language and writing at a deep level. And uh, I am very grateful. Wonderful, Zai. Also, there's, there's this constant question that uh, gets asked, you know, most of our people also ask, is it possible for a writer to make a living by writing books specifically on nature and all? What would your <laughs> take be on that? I can just, well, for me anyway, uh, the take is that um, it hasn't happened and it's not going to happen. But of course, there are writers who are way more successful than I am and way more marketable and it has happened for them. So it can, but that person is not me. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> you know, and if, if, if you can tell us about uh, the books that you're working on currently, one of the books that you, you mentioned, of course, was the Termite Fry. And if you can just, you know, Take yeah, us so the Termite Fry is one. It's about, um, it's, um, it focuses on an Irula family around the time of the snakeskin ban in India, which happened uh, just, you know, when the Wildlife Protection Act came out in the early 70s. And very often our regulations um, are kind of thrown out in this way overnight, you know, okay, no more snake skins. Well, what about the thousands of people whose livelihood depends on that? We don't pay much attention to that. So this is what uh, happened to the Irulas and it's one family's experience of uh, that period. So um, I've been very lucky to have worked very closely with the Irulas at the Snake Park and then at the Venom Center, uh, at the Croc Bank, and also a women's society, which I started for them about 40 years ago, with which I'm still involved. So a lot of forest experiences, a lot of meetings and workshops and spending time with them. So I was able to bring all that information and experience into the book. So it's about that and it's uh, due to be out in another week, I think. So can I request you, uh, Zai, to read a small, you know, um, small some text from the book itself that would be kind of, you know. I can do that. So I will just read the beginning of the book, a few paragraphs from the beginning. It is the beginning of the month of the Tamil month of Adi, which stretches over June and July. The pre-monsoon winds range, rage like fire through the eastern ghats, making neat tracks in the grass and the scrub. These low hills are the poor cousins of the rainforest clad western ghats which are home to tiger, giant rainforest trees, and super large hornbills and eagles that nest in the tall forest canopy. This eastern range is much lower and less green and lush, but it's the land of snakes, the hunting ground of the Irula tribe. It is here that Karadi and his family live and catch snakes. The glossy skins of big snakes like rat snakes, pythons, cobras and Russell's vipers are sold to skin dealers in the city and the money is good. From there they are shipped to many countries where fashionable people enjoy wearing belts, shoes and jackets made from them. The Irular have more money than any other tribe in South India. And some families even have a transistor radio. There's a joke among the Malai tribe of the Javadi Hills. One day, the Irular will even get electricity. Some Irulas enjoy the joke and repeat it, but Karadi doesn't like it. 
This kind of talk brings bad luck, he'd say. And his son, Mari, would nod in agreement. Karadi's wife, Rani, disagreed. She had other superstitions. It's not like that. Nothing will happen. And Mari would agree with that too. In this monsoon time of year, the southwesterly breezes are cool and damp. In a few days, they will turn into winds and bundles of gray cloud will roll and tumble in the sky. Karadi and his wife Rani's hut will turn into a musical box with just one tune, drip, drip, drip. And the road that skirts their village of Seneri will no longer be a road, but a lively river with fish and tadpoles and checkered keelback water snakes. Banana leaf boats will be launched downstream with shouts of glee. Monsoon is the best time of year for the Seneri kids and the worst for the adults. Clothes don't dry. Scorpions and centipedes move in without permission. Roofs leak like sieves. So this is the beginning of the book. That's so wonderful. It reminded me of the, uh, you know, the Andaman's boy, just right there, <laughs> bang in the action. It just starts. You know, as I one small, small request, if you can just tell us about your experience. Andaman's boy was such a amazing book, a tale about you know a boy growing up as well as you know the, the nature and everything around it. How did that book come across? You mean how did it happen? Yes, yes. Uh, well, it, uh, actually, it happened because uh, two Tulika editors uh, came to my place and said, write a teenage novel. And uh, I said, OK, I give it a shot. And I happened to be on sabbatical that year from Cody School. Uh, so I did it in about three months, the novel. And I think it was because everything was just ready for the get-go in my head. I had been several times to the Andamans. I was passionate about the place, very anxious about what was happening to the tribal community, especially the Jarawa. And so it was almost like up here, and I just had to make that little um, jump up to the top. And sometimes that's how it happens. But that, that's a beautiful example of how, you know, the editors just came, said, you know, we'd like a book from you. Um, let's do a novel for the teen age group. And it just happened. It was a very, I think it was probably one of the most natural writing processes I've ever had. With no writer's blocks. <laughs> okay, so if I were to ask you quickly, you know, just we are, we are moving towards the end of this conversation. If I were to ask you, what would you term as your inspiration uh, as an author per se? Who, who are the books that you really you know, kind of you find very inspiring authors? And which books would you dub as your favorite ones? Um. I would say um, Lawrence Van Der Post, definitely. Uh, Gerald Durrell. Uh, Gavin Maxwell. Yes. Uh, and uh, actually, Salim Amu himself, because even though uh, I'm not an ornithologist, I read his writing in the book a lot. And I just, you know, I've learned a lot from that language. Um, so, yeah, these are the ones I can think about. Okay. And if, if you, you had to choose between birds, crocs, and snakes, whom would you choose? <laughs> um, I think crocs, because the little bit of uh, field study and observation that I've done more seriously than otherwise uh, has been with crops. 
Okay. And I and found I, them very, very interesting. And this, this is where this is one question that someone asked uh, was also uh, within our university. You know, what is it about the Crocs that is you know very impressive for you? What what do you find you know attractive about the crocodiles? Well, that they're happy not to do anything. I think that's great. <laughs> um, one thing is that they've been so little studied, and there's still a lot to do. So that is always inspiring. For example, at the Croc Bank, we uh, d discovered that this is the only place in the world that the marsh crocodile lays two nests a year instead of one. And we still don't know how or why that happened, but it's something related to the temperature and you know the optimum care probably that they get here. The other interesting thing for me is that the uh, sex of the animal, the gender of the animal is decided by the temperature and not genetically. So this was a big uh, find in the croc bank for the, mug, for the marsh crocodile. Um, Another very interesting thing for me personally is that is how much the male is involved in the hatching of the nest as well as looking after the babies, uh, especially in the gharial and the marsh crocodile. So even though it looks like they're just lying there like rocks, they actually have a very interesting life. Interesting. Okay, as I, uh, you have worked with crocs, you have worked with snakes, any close encounters have I couldn't hear. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Sai. Yeah, I can Am hear I you. Sai? Yeah. Oh, finally, yes. So I was just saying one one final question was you know you have you have worked with crocodiles, you have worked with snakes. Any close encounters you have had with them? Have you been bitten by a snake or something? I think the uh, scariest was uh, when I was in one of the pens here uh, and I had a hide and I was doing observations during the uh, breeding season of the Magar. Um, and um, writing notes and whatever, doing timetables. And uh, I was uh, writing something in my notebook picking up my binoculars and suddenly there's this huge face at the window. I had no idea that a croc could actually get up that high. And I had to beat a very hasty retreat and jump over a wall. I didn't think I could jump over, <laughs> but that still remains with me that you know, <laughs> I have to build hides with your safety in mind. <coughs> Wonderful. Finally, Zai, uh, one last question, and there are a lot of writers here, aspiring writers who want to. You know, if there was one advice that you would give to people who, are, who want to wish to write books on nature and all, what would that be? I think um, really uh, deep, meaningful research is very important, especially now because we are writing for a generation that is so well informed. Um, you know, children are on the net, they're watching videos, uh, they're watching wonderful wildlife and conservation films. So we better really know what we're talking about. And um, the other is to really work at your manuscripts. It doesn't come easily, and that's where the discipline comes in. 
you have to draft and redraft and uh, for instance, the Termite Fry novel, uh, I had originally written the whole thing as a first-person account from the protagonist's point of view. And then when I finished it, I realized that it wasn't really working. So I had to write the whole thing again very differently. One has to be prepared to do that, to put in the time, to be committed, and to really be passionate about your own writing and believe in it. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, finally on that, uh, I, I would kind of, you know, we, we bring the conversation to that. Just one final thing is, there's another book on Salim Ali that you're writing. If you can just, uh, you know, today's book itself is Salim Ali, there's one more in the offing, if you can just talk us through. I have the cover, I'll just show it to the Yeah, audience. so that again is due out in June. Um, uh, originally, uh, it was a book published in the early 90s by Permanent Black uh, called Salem Ali for Schools. And uh, a lot of extracts, a lot of chapters from that book have been used in textbooks and readers for schools and colleges. So we decided to uh, look around and find a publisher who will um, redo it. And fortunately, Hatchet has taken it up. Again, a wonderful group of uh, editors to work with. And they have really added some uh, good material to it in terms of activities for children and uh, expect it to be out in the first half of June this year. So with that, we kind of, you know, come to an end to our uh, discussion today. Thank you so much, Zai. It was such a pleasure talking to you. You have also been part of our Nature Writing for Children. course that you gave uh, you were part of the course itself so thank you so much for your time today on for joining us thank you so much it's been a pleasure thank you thank you and with that i will just like to tell all our audiences we will meet again soon possibly next week for our conversation on nature in our city webinar series and my apologies for all the uh, tech glitches that we were having today but, but thank you again and hope to see you soon thank you bye bye